A warm welcome to Sister Talk. And my name is Emily Nimapare, and I am joined on the couch once again with my sisters, Lillian Mbaiwa, on my left-hand side. Hi, Lil. Hey. Lil. See, it's not Auntie Lil today. <laughs> <laughs> and on my right-hand side, I've got Auntie Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? Great. So today we really are holding a, a very um, interesting episode. This has really gotten to the core of us as sisters. We've been discussing this journey over a period of time. And we are labeling this episode, Can You Hear Me? Can you hear me? And many of you may be thinking, what does can you hear me mean? Um, but we've got two special guests with us today. On my left, I have Mkoma Kundi. Humbi, sorry, you are here. You see, he's in Dao, so I mustn't be messing your name. <laughs> How are you, Mkoma Kundi? I'm Kumbi. well, thanks. I'm well, thanks. Good. So Kumbi is a recovering alcoholic and founder of Healing Rain Foundation and an author of a book by the name of Despair Meets the Potter's Hand. Uh, it's a pleasure, pleasure to have you today on Good the to couch. Be here. Yeah. On the right hand side, I've got Mkoma Jacob. How are you, Mkoma Jacob? Hi, Milao. How are you? Good. So, Good. Jacob Shamiarira is also a member of Consolidated Africa Services PVO. Yes. And uh, Jacob and I know Jackie, has they have a long history together um, <laughs> with regards to the topic we're going to discuss today. But I just really want to get into this really fast um, and just say, when we talk about drug and substance abuse, this is, by the way, a two-part story. Um, we felt that this cannot be discussed in 20 minutes. It is something that is affecting households. And so, Mkoma Kumbi, tell me, what is your story? Uh, I drank for 18 years of my life, right? I am three years sober now, right? And there's quite a lot that goes into those um, 18 years. But just to cut it short, I started drinking when I was 13 years old, right? Mm -hmm. So at the age of 13, I actually knew how it felt not going for classes because I've got a hangover, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, then the story then progresses from there up until I got into corporate, right? And I, I became a functioning alcoholic, so they say. So everything looks great, honky-dory on the outside, mm -hmm. but from the inside, everything is broken. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that with my line of work, I used to travel a lot. So that also kind of like escalated my alcoholism. So I think I've been to like 13 different African countries. Mm -hmm. And while I was there doing work, obviously because of alcoholism, I would like spend all my money and left with no allowances. So I remember at times I would actually go for breakfast and then pack some food uh, so that I can have it in the evening because I don't have money for food anymore. Mm -hmm. And my family always used to wonder, why is it that when you're going out there, you're coming back much skinnier than you were when you left? Oh. Because you would expect someone to bulk up because you know hotel, you got allowances mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so it then, the story then went on to a point where I realized that this, there's an issue here. There's a problem and it needs to be to be dealt with. But uh, yeah, I think just to put it in short, that's that's the story uh, for now. But yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Right? Um, the abuse itself, the promiscuity itself, mm -hmm. and the body count itself of mm -hmm. the people that you uh, sleep with while you're consuming. And it's, it's, it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. So, yeah. So, oh gosh, in, instinctively, I've got so many questions and I know everyone else yeah. just wants to kind of dive mm -hmm. in. But you're talking about 13 years old. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did you hide that from your parents? Oh, so what happened is um, my parents passed on when I was pretty much that age, right? But what made me drink at 13, it's not necessarily the passing of my parents. My father used to hold these parties. Right. And then long back, I remember when we were like seven, eight. And in the morning, he would ask us to clean up the bottle tops. Mm -hmm. And I remember I would get the bottle tops and sniff them. And I'm like, mm -hmm. ah, uh -huh. what is in this bottle that makes everyone sound, you know, fancy when they drink and they're high? And I always used to say, I can't wait to grow up so that I can actually uh, uh, taste alcohol. He would even send us to the shops. I would be looking for bottle tops so that I can just sniff them. Wow. Incredible. Well, yeah. Um, like Kumbi, I also started drinking quite young. Um, and I drank for 14 years between the ages of 15 and 29. And you ask about how, how do we manage to hide it from our parents. 
it's it, it's quite easy, you know. Um, our community, our culture, really. There's a big drinking culture in in Zimbabwe, and um, it's 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 quite normal for for young guys to walk into a pub and start drinking. It's not a problem. Um, all the outlets we used to get our alcohol from, we we'll just walk in and buy. Nobody would really care um, how old you are, um, and. You know, my parents, when they discovered that I had started drinking, that was in when I was about 18, and I had a three-year lead time before they discovered anything. My brothers had found out, but they, did, they didn't say anything to mom and dad. And when they did find out, they, they then said, right, you know what, this isn't good for you, it doesn't work, you need to stop. And then the only thing you can do is to lie to them that, yeah, I have stopped. Yeah. Then you keep on hiding the, the behavior, they won't notice it up until the next time something big happens. That's when they say, oh, actually, you haven't stopped. So that, that was my, my experience, yeah. So there's a lot of lying. There's a lot of dishonesty with alcoholism. There's a lot of hiding, ducking and diving, and coming up with all sorts of excuse, excuses to make that drinking possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, going to the rural areas on holiday was an excuse to go and have a drink without them watching. Um, deciding to go on a business trip or an education trip, any opportunity just to be away from their watch would be used to maximum effect to drink. What was that moment when you said, enough is enough? I am not going to do this anymore. What, what was that moment? Well, for me, it was um, when I woke up one day, finding that everything I detested in a human being I had become. Because obviously, growing up as a young man, you would have all sorts of high ambitions, um, high expectations of yourself, and your, your parents will also have the same. And slowly, you, as, you start, as the alcoholism starts to kick in, you start rationalizing uh, or making changes to your ambitions uh, to suit the drinking. You don't change your ambitions to, to suit life itself, but the drinking just, that's, it, it then becomes your primary focus. Mm. So, when you, you, there's a place, there's a pub in, in, in my neighborhood. Um, and as a kid, as I, as I was going to school, I would pass through there and then ask myself, why are those guys there at the pub by seven o'clock in the morning? Aren't they supposed to be going to work, going to school, be doing some, something else productive? I always found those people to be weird up until I became one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's when I knew that, yeah. I, I, need, I, I need to stop. So it was a gradually um, descent into that kind of place. Um, but when I found myself there, I knew something needed to be done. And, and we, we have to take a short break, but I think this is really important for us to pick up from. Um, just to say, what is that moment? And what happened in the, you know, in the future after? What, what did your life, you know, how did it take shape? So Kumbi, we're going to pick up from that conversation. Jacob. <laughs> so, Jacob, we're going to pick up from that conversation. We're going to take a quick break. But for all those who are watching, this episode is on alcoholism. Can you hear me? We'll be back shortly. This is Sister Talk.
Welcome back to Sister Talk. And we are talking about substance abuse. We're talking about alcoholism. Um, and we have two special guests with us today. We've got Jacob and we've got Kumbi. Um, and just to pick up from the break that we had, Auntie Jackie, you had a couple of questions. Yeah, I think, as Emily, you know, during the break, Jacob mentioned that he was surprised that we were feeling so touched already with what you have shared. And we are surprised, like, really? Um, how bad can you go? Like, how deep is this thing? Because we felt like you went deep. But you're like, this is not even anything. Well, yeah, <clears throat> you know, with, um, with alcoholism, yeah. um, there, there are so many sides to it. There's happy stories, there's sad stories, there's mm -hmm. guilt, there's remorse, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But what I was sharing was really what happened to me in a very general way mm -hmm. um, and how, what happened afterwards mm -hmm. and how my life is like now. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also important that we look at the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because I think it's something that most people don't understand. Mm -hmm. And when, when we share, the aim is not to lecture people mm -hmm. on how they should drink or what they should do, but it's to use our personal experiences to help someone identify mm -hmm. with the issue if they can. Mm -hmm. If not, cool, it, it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But um, generally, there are two types of drinkers. Um, mm -hmm. There's one drinker who can control and enjoy their drinking, mm -hmm. and then there's the alcoholic. The mm -hmm. alcoholic can need the control and cannot enjoy the drinking. Mm -hmm. If they try to control it, they can't enjoy it. And when they're enjoying it, they're not controlling it. That's, when do you know that you're losing control? You know, um, I think when... If you start having problems, if any of your problems can be is attributable to alcohol, then you know that um, it's now a problem. When you start having accidents, when you start having personal problems, when you start having um, relationship issues, all because of your drinking. Actually, the moment you see someone just mentioning that you might have a drinking problem, that's a very bad sign. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, a, there's a checklist um, online, there's about 20 questions that you can look up. And when I eventually made the decision or the realization that mm -hmm. I think I have crossed mm -hmm. the line, I had looked those 20 questions online. And some of those questions will ask you things like, do you drink alone? Mm -hmm. I drank alone. Mm -hmm. Do you um, have, do you wake up remorseful mm -hmm. um, after having had a drink? When you sober up, you look at some of the things that you have done and mm -hmm. said and yeah, the remorse is there. Mm -hmm. um, have you had financial difficulties as a result of your drinking? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, you know, so the, the all, all those indicators are quite easy to help people identify mm -hmm. whether or not they, they are alcoholic. Okay. Yeah, but you know what, I'm thinking that um, by the time you reach a point um, where you decide to actually go and look up those signs, something would have triggered you to say, mm, maybe I have a problem. Because I really think that it takes a long time for someone who is an al alcoholic to even consider looking at that. And, and I think in some instances, you also try and justify, you know, some of, some of those, um, those pointers as well to say, ah, no, I think, you know, it's still, I'm still in a, in a good place. Yeah. Yeah. So I think my question, though, is um, because I'm a parent, what really has touched me about your stories is that you started drinking at such a young age. Yeah. Uh, maybe Kumbi, you can answer this one. Um, 13, you said? Yeah. 14. Absolutely. That's very, very young. And I feel like as a parent, we are not prepared to even consider that my 13-year-old might be drinking. What would you say, you know, how did you get access to even alcohol at that age? And how did you fund it? Because it's obviously an expensive habit. Mm. Now that's a good question. Uh, let me just answer it in, in two parts. Okay. Um, the first part is, you know, we're living in a society where we now have parents that actually need to be parented themselves, right? So when you get to a point whereby we have a younger generation mm -hmm. that are becoming parents and they really haven't got the fundamentals of being a parent, right? I think that's just a disaster. Right? Because they are more worried about the hustle, so to speak, putting food on the table, making money, and then they actually neglect uh, the basic fundamentals of parenting. And then they're now leaving their children 
to be parented by other children or to be parented by television or by music videos or by the culture that is happening at the moment. This is why when you go to, uh, to a mall, the dressing and everything of this younger generation, it's influenced by a certain culture. And as parents, well, well as a parent, a parent you, like you then yeah. probably say, oh, well, this is how it is in this modern day, right? And, and, and then you do. just let it slip away. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's yeah. very dangerous. And I think it's become so acceptable because yeah, we're saying, good. okay, so at my house, it's okay. And I'm seeing at your house, it's okay. And, yeah. you know, at your house, it's okay. Yeah. So it should yeah. be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So right? why am I punishing my child? Why am I making him or her stand out? Because that is the norm. So do you think we're throwing money at problems, at societal problems as parents? Absolutely. I definitely think so. Because we're trying to cover up for the time that we should spend with our children uh, with money. So it could be maybe entertainment. Like, I mean, sleepovers have just become the norm with this generation. I'm going to my friend, we're just going to be chilling and this and that. But the truth is, there's always alcohol involved, right? There's always girls, boys uh, involved. And yeah, that is, that is quite something else. That is and Kumbi, you mentioned something um, earlier on about, um, you know, sex being part yeah, of you know, yeah, the whole, yeah. you know, alcoholism yeah. or substance abuse. I mean, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Right, great. Let me just, I'm going to answer a question, but let me take you off a different tangent and then weave it back okay. to your question. You see, the thing is, you have to look at this whole thing, the issue of alcoholism, at a global picture, right? right? right. And what do I mean by that? From the very basic, from the very foundations of creation of the earth, right? I'm going to come back to your question. Mm -hmm. So even if you read the Bible, you see just right in the, in the beginning, you know, Noah after the floods, you know, the Bible, I think it's about verse, uh, verse 9, he goes on, he plants a vineyard, he gets drunk, and then he's naked yes. in his tent. Yes. Right, mm -hmm. you see it with Lot as well, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. and the daughters are like, yeah, let us sleep with our with father, father too, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible goes on to say the father never even felt anything, mm -hmm. right? So there is a thing with alcoholism, mm -hmm. right, preventing our purpose that God has put us here on earth for, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at like, if, if, if I actually see someone who's an alcoholic, what I'm worried about is, my goodness, what is it that they have to contribute to the kingdom of God mm -hmm. that the devil that is telling? That is telling? under attack. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is under attack. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. constantly throughout the Bible, high capacity people being attacked, being mm -hmm. attacked, getting into alcoholism, and then some actually uh, stop being effective in what they're trying to do. So to answer your question, it still comes back to that. So promiscuity and everything, it's all a means to, to, to distract you from doing exactly what you want to do. Yeah. I can just maybe push this to Jacob. When he stopped drinking, look at the things that he's managed to achieve. Yeah. I mean, he did the wellness thing. How many people came? We're talking about thousands. Mm -hmm. He's pushing campaigns and stuff like that. I stopped drinking the Birth of Healing Rain Foundation. Right. I authored the book. We're now helping people to understand this problem. You know, we're now contributing to the community, right? So imagine everyone who's going through abuse, imagine what they carry. Mm -hmm. Actually, to be honest, I'm not even worried about the alcoholic because the alcoholic knows they've got a problem. Mm -hmm. the, mo the person that is, in most, that is in the most dangerous situation is the regular guy. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy that goes at the bar, he just drinks, goes back home, mm -hmm and comes back, and life is passing yeah. away. Mm -hmm. Life is actually passing away. The person that actually, the person that doesn't know that they're an alcoholic, exactly. yet they are, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's And family knows that they're an alcoholic and talk behind their back yes. and don't bring it to the fore. Mm -hmm. So culture, Jacob, there's, there's, how does that play a role? Definitely it, 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 it does. It, it plays a very big role. As I mentioned uh, when we started off the conversation that in, for, and from my family, both sides, my mom and, um, and, and dad's side of the family, there's a very big drinking culture. Mm. Whenever there's a family function, um, you know that this uncle is definitely going to come drunk. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know that um, we even used to call it a beer run, which is sort of uh, a stop or a short um, break during the program 
to allow people to go and go to the shops and restock on on their alcohol. It's it's very common that uh, that those things happen. So we sort of celebrate alcoholics because we don't know the difference between the alcoholic and and and, and the non-alcoholic. And there's also a question that um, that uh, Aunt Lillian put forward: that how did you access <coughs> as a young man um, booze? There's a study that was done. Um, about Zimbabwe, and I'm sure it, it applies to the rest of the region um, where some of our followers are, um, that alcohol is cheap and it's accessible. Mm -hmm. For as little as one US dollar, you can get, uh, you can get um, 375 milliliters of, of moonshine whiskey. It's not the best, mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that you can drink and, and get high off. Mm -hmm. When you're 13, 14, you're not so much concerned about the, the quality of what you're drinking. You're just looking at the result. So for three bucks, you get a whole bottle, which is enough for a group of five, ten young, young, young guys. And then the real alcoholics from that group will then progress into just starting to drink more and more. Um, you know, there's there's a joke that I've heard. Some people say we used to drink in industrial quantities. That's that that's wow. really how it <laughs> that's scary. how it ends up. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So sorry, Antilo, mm -hmm. we need to take a break. Okay. But I think in our in our last segment, we need to then wrap it up and kind of share with people how do they get help at the end of the day. Mm. There you go. Please stay tuned. This is Sister Talk. Can you hear me? We'll be right back. Welcome back. And before we went to the break, Antilil, you had a question. Yes, my question was around, you know, um, the workplace. Because I think both of you, uh, especially Kumbi, when you were just going through the, the, the journey that you've walked, you mentioned that you were actually at work. And sometimes you travel at work whilst you're going through this suffering, through this problem. And I'm just wondering, what sort of support do you get at a workplace for a problem with substance abuse? Now, that's a good question. Um, I think, first of all, what we need to understand is if there's one common character defect that an alcoholic has is manipulation, mm -hmm. right? They can literally manipulate the whole system, right? Mm -hmm. I've got countless uh, warning letters, but I actually never got fired, you know, because I even went to an extent of creating my own disease, like I got the serious, I got serious ulcers, just so that when I don't make it to work, I've got a, I've got a card to put on the table, you know. So I'll pretty much drink Friday, Saturday, Sunday, probably skip work on Monday, on Tuesday, in some days, and then continue on Thursday and things like that. Mm -hmm. And at work, you can pretty much just get around it, right? Mm -hmm. But the, what I used the, the, the skill, so to speak, that I used, I made sure that when it's time to work, I work. 
Okay. When it's time to do the job, mm -hmm. I do it and I do it 100%. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, in, in, the, in a corporate setting, them realizing it, uh, they, 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 they don't get it. They, they didn't, didn't get identify it. They didn't the identify it. Yeah. Because you were day. functional. Exactly. And yeah. it confuses people because yeah. he was a performer when he was a performer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And he yes. was a non-performer yes. when yeah. he was a non-performer. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so like exactly. as, a, as, a, as a superior, I would yeah. be like, okay, so he's having a bad day. Yes. Like, but it's 100%. really an underlying yes. issue. Yes. Yeah. So um, Auntie Jackie, you had a couple of thoughts as well. Yeah, I think I wanted to pick up on the thought about um, our children and our relationships with them there seems to be other influences that are coming in. And I remembered when we talk about can you hear me, people probably want to say, what is this can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me became a name of a campaign to raise awareness around the issues of drug and substance abuse that we started in 2016. And the reason why we said can you hear me is because when we went to talk to young people, they said our parents don't hear us. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to spend with us. Yeah. We don't... Every time when you meet with the parents, I mean, I'm a parent as well, and I, I'm part of those parents, by the way, so I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger. But they were saying, they don't even know our colors. Like, what is my favorite color? They don't know my favorite food. They don't know anything about me except they'll ask me, did you do your homework? Yeah. Have you done this? Have you done that? That's the level, because we can also understand the parents also are busy, as you said, putting food on the table. But there seems to be a gap between parents and children and growing up in a place where you have something to say as a child, no one is hearing you. The parents also are saying, can you hear me to children who are not hearing them? Yeah. And God is saying, can you hear me? And no one, there seems to be no dialogue. There's no conversation. Yeah. So, so what can be done? Where do we start, Jacob? If you're gonna, if, if just to wrap up, yeah. What can if someone who is listening to you wants to actively, you know, address this issue? How do they do that? What's the first step? Look, um, I think just picking up from what what Jackie mentioned, um, addiction or alcoholism in this context is actually a disease of separation, where there is separation from God and separation from fellow man. Mm -hmm. So. There was an experiment um, which was done, I think, in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, where there was um, some rats. It's called the, ra the rat park experiment, mm -hmm. where they put in rats in, in a cage. And in one cage, um, they had cocaine-laced water. Mm -hmm. um, and there were two options of water. One was cocaine-laced and another one was plain water. Mm -hmm. And there was one rat locked up in there. And they found that the rat in that cage went on to drink the cocaine-laced water because it made it feel good. It loved, it always went for, for that cocaine-laced water. And then in another cage, they put in um, lots of rats inside, mm -hmm. um, lots of nice things for, for the rats. There was food, there was interaction, and none of the rats went for, for the cocaine-laced water. So the outcome of that experiment was that when there's inclusion, yeah. Where there is that communication, when there's a good sense of community, community. yeah, when there is love, mm -hmm. there is there is engagement, you will find you you'll have less and less addicts. And they they've actually done it um, in Portugal, where they've changed the laws to make um, they're no longer punishing people on um, on drugs. Mm -hmm. They're no longer incriminating and locking them up. So they've done with with the ruin. I think they did they, they've done that with the ruin. What they've done is they've set up government centers mm -hmm. where heroin addicts who go in, get a clean needle, get their supply from the state. And immediately that cut out the drug dealers. You know, it sorted that problem out. Mm -hmm. And then people are now going in into a controlled environment where they can access their products. Mm -hmm. and but Jacob, are we there yet in Zim? Because I'm hearing you speak mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm like, no, we're not there yet in Zim. That's and not our problem. We don't have those issues. Well, actually, we do. We do, we do have those and, issues. And, and another think. problem is, sorry, not, not a problem. Is yeah. I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we've got the two of you. You're both male. But I think we don't want to give the impression or perception to the audience that the problem is just a male problem. Yeah. So from your experience and from the, uh, what do you call it, programs that you've run, what would you say the percentage is between male and female? 
you know, to be honest, we haven't um, done any studies mm -hmm. to Just come up. Just very rough. You know, like you yeah, the the problem is, I think it's it's the the share is equal. It's okay. Um, right. You'll find as as many male alcoholics as there are female alcoholics, and you'll find alcoholism is not a respect of age, of gender, of income. Uh, of Color. race, mm -hmm. well, religion, in, in anything, any demographic consideration you'd want to put into place, you'll definitely find alcoholics um, and, and, and addicts. So it's, it's, it's really um, a, a serious problem. But I think the, the solution is inclusion, it's love, it's tolerance, mm -hmm. and there is definitely a spiritual solution to, to the problem, which is what worked for me. So Kombi... If you, if you were to speak to someone who is in this situation right now, not forecasting, but who is in it, what would you have to say to them? I would definitely say honesty is, is, is the key to all this. Right? You just have to be honest with yourself and say, you know what, I actually think I have a problem. But I think the measuring tool is not there for people to actually identify that I have a problem. Because a lot of people are actually just in limp mode but they don't actually realize that they, they're in limp mode, right? Mm -hmm. I say to myself, because I speak with a um, couple of addicts, I always tell people that if you have woken up and you have said to yourself more than five times, I will never drink alcohol again because you've done something, you've spent rent money or whatever, you yeah. were promiscuous, whatever, you're definitely an alcoholic and you need to seek help. So Jacob, where can people go to get help? Well, I think, you know, there, there are so many groups. When, when I did my personal uh, search online, I found so many groups available that, um, that could help, uh, including churches, other support groups, um, and high school counselors as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's, there's lots of help out there. And, but the most important thing is it lies within the individual. Are they willing to ask for that help? Because I think, in my journey, that was the most difficult thing to say, to put my hand up and say, Lot, I'm having problems and I need to speak to someone. Mm -hmm. So I think people just need to look up online mm -hmm. and identify which, which group they'll be willing to, to get to. But it's important that you just speak to someone um, to get the help. Kumbi, I hear you going, mm. <laughs> tell me. Oh, no, he, he just uh, touched a nerve there. I remember when, when I was trying to get sober, I didn't have anyone to talk to, mm -hmm. right? To a point where I actually then wrote 365 quotes of my very own because I just needed to say something, but I, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to approach. And so, yeah, I think, uh, like you said, we've got lots of organizations, yeah. um, uh, churches as well, right? And uh, some counselors as well. I think the, the, the resources are there, but it's just now a matter of, are people willing to identify that they've got a problem and actually start pushing to get help? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. it's one thing telling someone, go and get help, and it's another thing for someone to say, I have a problem, I need help. Yeah. yeah. Two very yeah. distinct. Very, very, very distinct. Mm -hmm. and, and Jackie, you, you mentioned very quickly, and as we close this episode, you were talking about trauma. In just a small bit, talk to us about that. Yeah. I think, you know what, in our, I, I saw a researcher, so I'll just talk about this very briefly, that um, CDC, they actually did a research on childhood trauma and its effect on things like this, on disease when we grow up. So trauma, a lot of us, we are growing up sometimes in a very traumatized state for one thing or the other. It could be trauma from broken relationships. It could be trauma from broken marriage, you know, family environment, you know, even trauma from something that happens, abuse that happens to us. And the more incidence of trauma that a person has, the more likelihood there was a study done like that. That links you to you possibly experiencing some kind of um, issues that we're talking about here. Disease. It could be even any physical disease, illnesses. I think we are in a broken world, broken people bringing up broken people. And I think this is why, the, the, you know, the sense that this issue needs to be addressed from a community perspective 
is important. We have to get the community right. Yeah. It's a village that raises a child. And if we don't look at the different, because the child is at risk from different aspects of the community. It could be at home. It could be at school. It could be at church. Someone in the community can either be a risk or it can be a protective factor. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be dealt in a, it's not a one-stop solution. We've got to be able to get join hands and deal with it. Jacob, yeah. your parting words. Well, yeah, um, the challenges are real. Um, but the good thing about it is that there is a solution. Mm -hmm. And the solution lies in talking to someone who's been through that journey. Mm -hmm. um, and those people are, they are, they are available, They're available in so many spaces. And it only needs that honesty, that open-mindedness, and most importantly, the willingness to start on that journey. For me, that's, that's how it worked. Kumbi, you mentioned something uh, as we wrap up as well, and your parting words as well. You said it hurts you to see a woman drinking when she's holding her child. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've got different spots for drinking nowadays, just sprouting up. And you see parents that actually, that are actually with their kids. We're talking of five, six years old. And they've got them on the lap and then they're in the car and then they're drinking. But what you're actually doing, you're actually just conditioning the mind of that child that this is acceptable, this is good. So I think as parents as well, we're not, we're not doing um, a good job. But uh, my parting words will be the solution is what we have here or what you guys going on here with Sister Talk is actually a solution. Mm -hmm. Because the more we have people come out and tell their story, the more we have people start thinking about it, right? In, in some cases, we, we don't actually realize we have a problem. But if I hear something, I can, wow, that sounds like me. You know, I can see myself mm -hmm. through the mirror of someone, yeah? And then that can then uh, prompt, you know, uh, real life change. So if we can have more people that are out there with stories and they have platforms where they can share their stories, I think that that's, that's a start. The power of testimonies. The power of testimonies. Yeah. Until though, any parting words from your end? <sighs> you know, I mean, this has been very powerful, but I think it's just for me to say, I keep going back to being a parent and, and just saying that, you know, all the parents out there, there's nothing to be ashamed of but your child, because I think there is a tendency you know, also to, to, to feel ashamed, you know, that she's, where did I go wrong, mm -hmm. you know, that my child is in this position. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So many more parents out there mm -hmm. are going through the same thing. And I think like you're saying, if people know and, you know, take away the stigma because it's a problem that the community has, mm -hmm. um, you know, then we could be able to help more children. So um, I think we are all bringing to the table some really important issues. Auntie Jackie, last words from your end. Yeah, I think it's just to say that this is a continuous conversation. It, we, just did the, we just touched the very tip of it. Um, but I think it's for me is to encourage someone out there. All of, us, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible Great. says. 100%. So don't look at us and say we are perfect because no one knows what is happening on our inner side. Mm. Uh, and I think it's to encourage that which you spoke about, the promise within you. You can do it. You know, you can do it. You can get up. There's something bigger that you are supposed to do if you just accept and look out for the help that you need to be able to do better. Yeah. So it's an, it's an encouragement. Some of us come from dark past as well. Yeah. And if it was not for the grace of God, we wouldn't be sitting where we are. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Okay. Another just really, really important topic that we're addressing. But as we wrap up the show, I just want everyone to understand when we say, can you hear me? Auntie Jackie is a founder of an organization called Seed Foundation. And from Seed Foundation, the dream and the vision that she had was around giving a voice to those who are voiceless. And it manifested itself around, can you hear me? So thank you, Auntie Jackie, for really doing that. Jacob, thank you so much for joining us today and really sharing your story and extending yourself. Um, and the great work you're doing. And the great work that you're doing. Well Incredible done, work that you guys yeah. are doing. Yeah. Nkoma Kumbi, thank you so much for sharing your story. I know it will resonate with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your book. If you can, please look for it. Where can they find your book? It's just being published at the moment. It's being published, right, so, so don't forget so we look to look to, for it. Yeah. Uh, and we look forward to, to reading it. your book. Yeah. Awesome. Um, for all those who are watching, 
it is important for you to understand the key messages that are out here. For the mothers that are watching and you don't understand what your children are doing, you need to watch. You need to take care. You need to go beyond just giving um, just the, uh, you know, the touch point moments. Really understand what your kids are doing. They're speaking to us. We need to fight for our kids. In our previous episode, we were talking about fighting for our kids. Yeah. When If you are dealing with substance abuse in your family, you have got to fight. fight. You have got to fight. Yeah. And you do not have to fight by yourself. And you don't They're, give up. And you don't give up. The conversations will continue here on this couch. This is Sister Talk. Can you hear me? See you next time. Sayonara. Sayonara.